Today's topic is on inflammatory resolution. And this topic is important for anyone with inflammation or anyone who might ever be inflamed. So therefore it's important for everybody because inflammation is necessary and important. And I think people might lose sight of that because you know, any of the diseases we hear about heart disease, cancer, autoimmunity, infection, all of these things include inflammation and the tissue damage that occurs in them is inflammatory. So we tend to uh, look at inflammation as a negative and want to run from it. And so, you know, we're taught to take our anti-inflammatories, whether those are aspirin or NSAID or fish oil or vitamin D or turmeric or whatever the sexy thing of the moment is, we're all more prone to look at anti-inflammatories as positives and anything that's pro-inflammatory as negatives. And that's just not a proper way to look at it. Uh, it is scientifically, you know, unquestionable that there is a physiologic state of inflammation normally. So there's a normal level of inflammation that the body should have, and that is needed for our immune system to have a crosstalk with the tissues and with the microbiome and with the environment so that it's always staying on top of, you know, what's, what's in making its way inside our body and what's going on in the various tissues so that it can respond appropriately. If there were no inflammation, then we wouldn't have a proper immune response. And obviously if there's too much inflammation, that can be a bad thing too. So the way that we prevent too much inflammation is through resolution of inflammation. And that is a process that is understood by science and should happen according to a certain time scale, et cetera. And that's what I want you to understand today because many of you suffer from autoimmune diseases and chronic inflammation is a promoter of autoimmune disease. Many people are worried about infections and severe infection. And so uh, one thing that promotes severe cases or severe infections is the a poor, uh, res poor resolution physiology or poor levels of inflammation resolving compounds. All right, so this first study was in molecular medicine from 2012. And this study ha has a great graphic show helping us understand in the inflammatory process. And so if we scroll down to that, you can see it here. And I'll zoom in. And what you can see is three graphics. Uh, a is the normal graphic. B is low immune suppression. C is high. So the y-axis is the magnitude of the response. The x-axis is the time that it takes. And so the yellow is the normal response. The yellow is, or excuse me, the yellow is infection. So in this case, yellow represents infection. Uh, we could also look at it as just being any inflammatory stimulus, okay? So the purpose of this study used infection. Infection's on everybody's mind currently, so we can stick with that. Yellow means infection. Green is the inflammatory response. So green is the immune response, the pro-inflammatory immune response to the infection. And then the pink is the immune system's anti-inflammatory response or the resolution response to the infection. So in a normal situation, if you're looking at graphic A, you have at time zero, you have an infection and the infection spikes because anytime you have, have an infection, there's a slight delay time-wise between the, the, say, a virus in this case, infecting your tissues and the immune system recognizing it and responding. So the infection occurs, the microbe gains a little bit of uh, a, a hold on, in your tissues, and there's a time delay until your immune system recognizes and creates the, the green pro-inflammatory response in a healthy immune system and an immune competent person, uh, that pro-inflammatory immune response as it ramps up, knocks down the infection 
to a point of zero, so you clear the infection, and in that same healthy immune competent person, then you no longer need the pro-inflammatory response. So the immune suppressing or anti-inflammatory inflammatory resolving response, the pink response ramps up and drives the green pro-inflammatory response back to the physiologic normal level. And then at the end of the pink hill, you have resolved inflammation the tissue and any tissue damage that occurred from the virus has been healed. Things are good. You move on with your life. That's the ideal immune response to an inflammatory stimulus or trigger. Now, it's possible that you could have too high of an inflammatory response. If you look at graphic B, you see the same infection, the yellow, the yellow spike. And then the difference from graphic A is that the green hill, the pro-inflammatory response is, is too high or too robust. So yes, you clearly clear the infection effectively. The problem is that the pro-inflammatory response in this case is so high that the anti-inflammatory or immune inflammatory resolving response is insufficient to suppress the too high inflammatory response. Therefore, this person would be left with systemic inflammation or a, a highly pro-inflammatory state that leads to further tissue damage, and when left chronic, can lead to autoimmune disease. And we don't want that, right? Graphic C shows the opposite. In graphic C, you can see the infection take hold, and you can see the immune system ramp up its pro-inflammatory response but it's not sufficient to kill the virus. It's less than the viral load. So it knocks down the virus a little bit, but is not sufficient to clear it. So the, the viral load stays elevated. So you have an insufficient pro-inflammatory response. And in this graphic, you have a robust anti-inflammatory response. So you, you might say, well, what the heck, if I have a robust anti-inflammatory response, we should be able to clear the virus, right? Well, no, it's the pro-inflammatory response that kills the virus, the anti-inflammatory response that then resolves the damage. If you're too anti-inflammatory, then you can't mount an effective enough pro-inflammatory response and therefore can't clear the, the virus. And so you have chronic infection. And this is how you could be chronically inflamed and chronically infected at the same time. Right? It sounds like that's a counterintuitive scenario, but this is, this is how it happens. You're chronically infected because you're chronically inflamed from the chronic infection due to your inability to mount a sufficient pro-inflammatory response to clear it. So this person has too much anti-inflammatory response going on, preventing proper clearance. Therefore, it's not resolved and you have chronic infection, which may result in autoimmune disease or cancer or, you know, heart disease or depends on the infection and the tissue and that sort of thing. So we want scenario A. We want to be able to detect infection when it's there, mount the proper response, and then clean up the mess after. And so how do we do that? How do we resolve inflammation? Well, in 2010, a paper came out looking at pro-resolving mediators. And Carl Nathan is the author of this study called Non-Resolving Inflammation. Uh, he's at Cornell University and is a leader in this topic. And you can see the first line says, non-resolving inflammation is a major driver of disease. Perpetuation of inflammation is an inherent risk because inflammation can damage tissue and necrosis, which is tissue damage, can provoke inflammation. So you get this vicious cycle of inflammation, tissue damage, inflammation. And if you look down a little further, it says, aside from persistence of the initiating stimuli, so aside from a persistent, persistent virus or persistent tissue damage, non-resolution may result from deficiencies in mechanisms associated with inflammatory resolution. Okay, well, what are some of those mechanisms? That's what today's about, because if we can understand the natural uh, physiology that promotes resolution, and there's, there's 
say supplements or nutrients that we can use to promote resolution, we can hopefully prevent chronic disease, autoimmunity, severe cases of infection, et cetera. So if we look at this, this is a great study, uh, but this has a really good graphic here looking at non-resolution of inflammation. You can see there's various methods or mechanisms by which resolution won't happen and non-resolution of inflammation can result in atherosclerosis, COPD, obesity, cancer, MS, asthma, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis. So you can see that whatever the reason for non-resolution of the inflammation leads to bad things. And it's important to know that one mechanism while we're on the, the topic quick of non-resolution of inflammation is chronic NSAID use. Again, that might be another mind blown moment because well, doesn't NSAID stand for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs? Yes. Well, then how could an anti-inflammatory drug be pro-inflammatory, right? Or resolution toxic? Um, I'll tell you, NSAIDs are proven to be what's called resolution toxic, meaning they prevent inflammatory resolution or promote chronic infection. And they're resolution toxic in the context of chronic use. So for those of you out there interested, the best time and most effective time to use NSAID medications is acute, acutely. So if you have an acute injury, you know, NSAIDs acutely for short term help resolve inflammation. But if you take them chronically, uh, I had a consultation with a woman recently who said for three years, she took 1600 milligrams a day of ibuprofen. Um, and, you know, I was like, holy cow, how do you have kidneys still, you know? And so that would be a situation that is resolution toxic. Chronic use of NSAIDs leads to uh, is, is leads to non-resolved inflammation. And the, the, the way it does it is by interfering with COX-1 and 2 pathways and resolvents, which we'll talk about. So just be aware that NSAIDs are best used acutely after injury and don't use them chronically because the king of inflammation resolution, Carl Nathan, says they are resolution toxic. So how do we resolve inflammation? Well, there's multiple mechanisms, but one, uh, one key piece to it are these things called endogenous pro-resolving lipid mediators. And these things come from essential fatty acids and lead to what their name says. They're pro-resolving. They lead to inflammatory resolution so that you can have a healthy immune response to antigen like graphic A in the first paper. I'll just read quickly from this abstract. Complete resolution of acute inflammatory response and its return to homeostasis or balance are essential for healthy tissues. Uh, here we review ongoing efforts to characterize cellular and molecular mechanisms that govern the resolution of self-limited inflammation. There are mediators from major omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA termed resolvins and protectins. And these things govern resolution and endogenous anti-inflammatory response. And they also display potent protective actions in the lung, kidney and eye, as well as enhance microbial clearance. Okay, so clearing infection. Uh, and one of the major areas they do that is the lung. So this could be relevant to recent events and hint. So if we go down and look at a key graphic in this paper, you can see here, omega-6 fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids. These are both essential fatty acids. The word essential means you cannot make them, so you must consume them. Again, just like most people would say inflammation is bad, anti-inflammatories are good, most people who have read a little bit about fatty acids might categorize omega-6 fats as bad and omega-3s as good because omega-6s are pro-inflammatory and omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. As I talked about at the beginning of this video, 
there's not good or bad, there's necessary. And in this context, there's essential. They're both essential. So they're not good or bad in and of themselves or inherently. Where they become good or bad is if the ratio gets skewed. The reason omega-6 fats could be bad for Americans is because the typical American diet is dominant in omega-6 fats. Your cookies, your crackers, your chips, your breads, your your oils, your canola oil, vegetable oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, right? Everything's omega-6. And so when the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio gets skewed or dominated in the six side, then you're pro-inflammatory, you're chronically inflamed, and you and that promotes disease, pain, autoimmunity, et cetera. But in, in a four to one to one to one ratio, it's good. So anyway, back to the resolvins and protectins. The omega-3 fats are anti-inflammatory and they're anti-inflammatory by affecting the Cox and LOX pathways. And they're also anti-inflammatory by EPA and DHA being broken down into E-series resolvins and D-series resolvins and protectins respectively. And I've talked about this in my book called The Autoimmune Answer. You can read more about it there. But relevant to this video, um, it's, it's, they promote inflammatory resolution, as you can see on this color graphic or this inflammation resolution timeline, right? Up here, you have initiation of inflammation. It's pro-inflammatory. And then you add, you, you accomplish clearance of microbe or tissue damage. And then we need resolving agents to put the fire out, so to speak. And just so you know, I won't dive into it in this video, but in my book, I talk about how E-series and D-series resolvins are useful for different tissues and different diseases, et cetera. We'll just do a, 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 a flyover in today's video and just show you quickly. Um, this, this table, E-series resolvins, are useful for skin issues, for peritonitis, for GI or colitis, for periodontitis, for eye issues, retinopathy, uh, D-series resolvins and protectins are also useful for skin, gut, kidney, eye, et cetera. So if you're looking for specific tissues and specific issues, you can use them for those. But if you just want to have optimal inflammatory resolution like scenario A, they're also important. So what does this mean? Where can you get them? Well, you can buy supplements that have pro-resolving mediators in them. They're called SPM, specific pro-resolving mediators. Those supplements tend to be very expensive because you know, you're breaking down the fish oils into the E and D series resolvins and the specific SPMs. But um, I posted a study yesterday on Facebook talking about new findings and uses of these things. And, and, and another doctor posted, well, here's the product I use. What do you recommend? And he had one of the SPM products, which is good. But again, it can be uh, economically difficult to use those long term for a lot of people. So I like to use just normal fish oil, right? Because as the study shows that the, the pro-resolving mediators come from omega-3s. And guess what? Most Americans, at least, are deficient in omega-3s and have a skewed omega-6 to 3 ratio. So a more economical way to increase their resolvin levels is to improve their omega-3 levels, reduce their omega-6 levels if necessary, and let the body convert the EPA and the DHA to resolvins and protectants. Now, where I would say use the SPMs, the more expensive products would be if you have an acute need, right? You have an acute infection, uh, severe, or you have acute tissue injury, you know, or you have say chronic inflammation where someone has good fish oil levels and they need, and, and that's not getting them where they need to be. Well, perhaps there's an issue with the enzymes that convert the EPA or DHA to their respective products. So in that case, you could, override the enzymatic deficiency by just giving them the end product directly, right? So those are some scenarios where you could look at it differently. And so these studies 
show us how to create an optimal immune response to inflammation, help us resolve inflammation, and show us a nutrient that is essential for health that we can use to promote optimal inflammatory resolution. And one last reason why I like to use omega-3 instead of the SPM products is that omega-3s have a myriad of benefits to the rest of the body outside of the anti-inflammatory benefits. So, you know, if you're given just the SPMs, you may not get those benefits, but you give the omega-3s, you're getting all kinds of collateral benefits.